Today's episode is going to be very interesting and quite lengthy. So ladies and gentlemen, grab your seatbelt. Hey guys, what's going on? I hope you are having a fantastic day so far. There is a new movement in place of epic proportions. It's called hashtag eight can't wait, and it is a movement to promote eight policies that should be implemented within police departments across the nation. I'm going to break each one of these down and give you guys some surprising information on them. I'm also going to give you guys actual examples of my own police department's policy. That's right, these are rules I also have to adhere to. It doesn't get any more real than reading my own department's policies. And for those of you getting into law enforcement, pay very close attention because knowledge is power, kids, and knowing your department's policy will keep you out of trouble. Number one, no chokeholds or strangleholds. First of all, most police departments already have policies on when, if ever, you're allowed to use a chokehold. My own department's policy says it has to be a last resort to control somebody that is extremely violent. You've exhausted all other measures and this person is still trying to kill you or somebody else, then fine, use it. But there is a list of criteria that must be met aside from that. First of all, the technique you use has to be approved. You have to go to training for this that your department approves. You can't apply it on the elderly. You can't apply it on pregnant women. You can't apply it on obvious juveniles because you know, some of them look 32. You can't apply it on anybody with a mental disability like Down syndrome, and you also cannot apply it to anybody with an obvious neck deformity. The policy further states that anybody that's put in a chokehold has to receive medical attention immediately whether or not they went unconscious. You have to notify the jail staff if the chokehold's been applied. You have to notify a supervisor. Finally, the use or even the attempt of using a chokehold has to be well documented by the officer. The issue is that a lot of officers are applying chokeholds when they aren't trained to do so and they don't understand how they work and they're holding on too long. And yes, that is dangerous. But getting rid of chokeholds altogether and not using them in fear of getting in trouble is not very suitable when you're on the side of the road fighting for your life and somebody's trying to grab your gun. Okay, moving on to number two, requirement of de-escalation. Folks, this is already in play for most police departments. In Georgia, we are literally required every single year in order to maintain our certification through the state of Georgia to attend de-escalation courses. Here is the list of required categories in Georgia and you have to have so many hours per year. You don't maintain those hours, your certification gets suspended. Not only is it required by the state, but my department requires it through policy. We have an entire part of the policy that is just dedicated to de-escalation. In fact, I'm going to read you guys the exact excerpt from my department's policy regarding de-escalation. An officer should use de-escalation techniques and other alternatives to higher levels of force consistent with his or her training whenever reasonably possible and appropriate before resorting to force and to reduce the need for force. Whenever reasonably possible and when such delay will not compromise the safety of an officer or another and will not result in the destruction of evidence, escape of a suspect, or commission of a crime, an officer should allow an individual sufficient time and opportunity to submit to verbal commands before force is used. It doesn't get any more black and white than that to me. And departments that don't have some sort of a de-escalation policy should. Number three, requiring a warning before shooting. I can tell you guys right off the bat that is not going to happen every single time. Why not? Because of this. So you're telling me in that short instance, you expect an officer to tell somebody that they're gonna shoot them. Sorry, that's not gonna happen. When shit hits the fan, it is not practical all the time to give a warning. And I'm sorry, but there's not one officer in this country that's going to stand there while he's getting shot at just long enough to give a warning. And any officer that does is probably going to become a casualty. Number four, exhaust all alternatives before shooting. This is another one I know is already in the books for most police departments. And honestly, this one is just common sense. Yet again, here is another policy excerpt. Deadly force may be used when the individual has a weapon or is attempting to access one and it is reasonable to believe the individual intends to use it against the officer or another person. Number five, duty to intervene. Duty to intervene basically places an obligation on officers to stop one another from using excessive force. Let's look at George Floyd's death as an example. Officers and citizens across the United States all agree, we all agree that the officers that stood there should have stopped Derek from killing George Floyd. We all agree on that. So people started raising hell saying that a policy needs to be in place to hold those officers accountable. Duty to intervene. Guess what folks? 
There was. Minneapolis, since so many people wanted to give me crap in my last video about how I pronounced it, actually enacted that policy in 2016. It says, officers are required to either stop or attempt to stop another sworn employee when force is being inappropriately applied or is no longer required. My department also has a policy in place with pretty much the same verbiage. Ours is titled, duty to intercede. Any officer present and observing another officer using force that is clearly beyond that which is objectively reasonable under the circumstances shall when in a position to do so, intercede to prevent the use of unreasonable force. An officer who observes another employee use force that exceeds the degree of force permitted by law shall promptly report these observations to a supervisor. Number six, we should ban shooting at moving vehicles. Okay, you guys are gonna laugh at this one. Literally the first words of our policy in regards to shooting at moving vehicles is shots fired at or from a moving vehicle are rarely effective. <laughs> this isn't the Wild West. You know, we're not in a movie. Anyway, moving on. The rest of this policy says officers must carefully consider the likelihood that missed shots may endanger bystanders, motorists, or other officers in the vicinity before determining whether shooting at or from a moving vehicle is objectively reasonable under the totality of circumstances. Officers should avoid placing themselves in the path of a moving vehicle to avoid possibility of having to discharge their firearm at such vehicle if possible. Officers should move out of the path of an approaching vehicle instead of discharging their firearm at the vehicle or any of its occupants if possible. What's interesting about this policy is that it very clearly says, don't jump out in front of a moving car just to give yourself a reason to shoot. Number seven, the requirement of a use of force continuum. This one has to be the dumbest I have seen on this list so far. I don't know of any department nationwide that does not have some sort of force model that officers have to abide by. Now pay attention because this part is important. What this group is doing by trying to push this initiative is they are going back in time. The use of force continuum is actually severely outdated and a lot of departments are moving away from it. Use of force continuums were actually developed decades ago before the courts really issued guidance on use of force. It's a very two-dimensional model that's flawed. Most police departments are moving away from the use of force continuum and they are adopting the objective reasonableness standard. Now, what is objective reasonableness? Go study Graham versus Connor. It is a 1989 case that I guarantee you will be on one of your academy tests. In Graham versus Connor, the Supreme Court ruled that the force used by police must be objectively reasonable. That an officer's actions were reasonable given the circumstances. Bam, more knowledge. Last but not least, require comprehensive reporting. This is another dumb one that should be common sense. When anyone ever asks you what cops are, the only correct answer really is fact finders. That's it. It doesn't sound so glamorous after all, does it? Our job is to find facts about a case and then you present them to a court of law. We're not judges, juries, or otherwise. From day one, you are taught how important it is to be as descriptive as possible in your report writing. Unfortunately, that can mean hours in front of a computer typing, but you know what? Welcome to police work. It's not what you see on TV. Being smart and keeping the events that you have responded to well-documented will save your butt in every aspect. And don't ever stretch the truth to try to get a conviction in court. The moment you are found on stand lying about a case, I guarantee you, especially these days, your career is done. Whether or not we get a conviction does not matter. What matters is that you do your job appropriately, correctly, and professionally. But most importantly, honestly. That's the game, folks. That is the truth about police work. And as far as these eight policies that are wanting to be implemented, uh, most of them, as you guys can see, and I've showed you real live examples, uh, most of them already are. It's the few bad apples that aren't adhering to them that are making people want them, but they're already in place.